empiricism are, here's the word, empiricism. The two rules of empiricism are, everything that we study has to be observable. Now that doesn't just mean with the eyes, that could be any of the senses. It has to come through one of the sensory organs. Touch, taste, smell, hearing, and vision. It has to be observable. And the other thing it has to be is measurable. You have to be able to say, it weighs this much. It is this length. It is this volume. It is this temperature. So we have two rules of science that are, has, of, of, that, that are empirical rules. It has to be observable, and it has to be measurable. Now, I think you all can see in this that we run into a problem when we study human beings and the human condition. There's a lot in the human condition that can be argued that is not measurable and not observable. Thank you. When we get into discussions about mood, about emotion, um, about co like very interesting concepts, like we, we may even discuss the idea of a, a certain vibe that we get in a situation, a feeling, like a, it's not a tactile feeling, but like an emotional feeling. Well, these are all beyond the observable and measurable. The gut, intuition, stuff like this, right? You can't observe this and you can't measure it. For something to be observable, it can't just be in the scientific rules of observability empirical observation, it can't just be observable to ourselves, like we can all observe our own dreams, but none of us can observe another person's dreams. See, that's the key, you have to be able to observe it in another person. So just to, in case that's confusing, yes, I can observe my emotions, I can observe my motivations perhaps, I can observe my dreams, but I can't observe these things in you, I can't see it, I can't weigh it, I can't take its temperature. Right? So that like, lies beyond the, the, the scientific. And it, I think it poses a significant problem for psychologists who, who choose to only look at the observable and the measurable. There's big stuff out there that has maybe, quite possibly is a thing that really makes us human that's not observable and measurable. So let's take a, an example of this just to show you. I look at the temperature gauge over here and say that temperature gauge says that it's 70 degrees in here. Now that's a scientific statement. It is 70 degrees. As long as that instrument for measuring the temperature is accurate, and it's set up to some standardization that we all culturally agree on, Celsius, Fahrenheit, whatever this is, and how mercury reacts in different um, conditions, then we can all agree it's 70 degrees in here. But some of you right now might feel chilly and have your coat and hat on. Other people might be feeling stuffy and hot and taking off your coats and jackets and getting right down to, you know, the minimum amount of uh, coverage. <laughs> See, there's a difference here. To say, I'm hot, I'm cold, I'm comfortable, I'm un uncomfortable, this is beyond the measurable or observable. This is more of a phenomenological, subjective, personal experience. And I think it's worth noting that it can be argued, and I often argue, that the phenomenological experience is much more important to us than the empirical experience, or what I would call the scientific measured experience. 70 degrees might be an interesting fact, but at the end of the day, what really matters to us, how comfortable we are, are in the room, right? That's beyond the scientific. That comes down to a subject. So that's just a little bit of an example of how we, we see there are things in our life that just because we have a number for it to weigh or to measure, look at IQ, look at your test grades, things like this. These are measurements. They're numbers and statistics that are put onto a measurement. But just because we measure it, that's not the whole story. I think you would all agree that your IQ store isn't an IQ store. Your IQ score isn't the whole story of who you are. You wouldn't want to walk into a room, regardless if your IQ was, you know, maxed out at the top end, or below 70, you wouldn't want to walk in and meet someone new and hand them a piece of paper with three digits on it or two digits and be judged completely by that score. Right? We are much more complex. We have a much richer essence to ourselves. So that's empiricism, observable and measurable. And we're now moving into how you apply these two uh, ideolo this ideology into the thing called the scientific method. Are there any questions or thoughts? It's pretty straightforward, right? It's also, I think, maybe sometimes interesting to, to think about this because in our culture, science is so celebrated that we kind of think, well, if something's examined scientifically, that's the whole story. It's not the whole story. There's something more going on here that's beyond science. And uh, just as a side note, I think that psychology is making great strides towards realizing 
that this obsession with science, although it has aspects that are really incredible, like in neuropsychology, when we're looking at brain chemicals and brain tissues and nervous system functioning, endocrine functioning and genetics, yeah, that's cool stuff. And that's very important to study, to understand, but there's other stuff that may have been neglected in the past 50, 60 years that needs to be looked into, and I think psychology is now more open to this. One of the case in point might be, have you all learned in APA style writing, which you're going to learn in this class? Um, there's a style of scientific writing that sounded very scientific. Like when you write up an APA style, you, you would never wrote I, I, write I, I, me, it's my experience. It's always you remove yourself and speak from the third person. Subjects test it. You know, it's like this removal, and it sounds and feels scientific. And now the rules of the APA are being rewritten where people can write and it can be accepted in the first person based on their own experience. So I think that things are loosening up a little bit and heading in a better direction than they have been uh, up until this point in American psychology. Okay, scientific method. Three steps. I've I boiled this down to three stages. You may have learned it in six stages. Sometimes people, some textbooks put it in seven steps. I use three simple steps that encompass the whole thing. The first thing in the scientific method is you come up with an idea. Does anyone remember what we call an educated, well thought out idea in science? Go ahead. Hypothesis. Holy cow, hypothesis. Cool. <laughs> That's our hypothesis. <coughs> See this word? Hypothesis. Hypo meaning below, thesis meaning theory. It's not yet quite a theory. Hyper would be above, hypo is below. So we have below a theory, hypothesis, hypothesis. Now here's the key step. In science, you can't just come up with a good idea and, and write about it and say, this is it. That's philosophy. In philosophy, you can argue, you can come up with an idea and write a text on it and argue and say, and this is the reason that I feel this is the case. And give your, your logical analysis of, the, of this. If it's psychoanalysis, you might even give your irrational or illogical analysis of it. Continental philosophers like to turn everything on upside down. And like uh, you'll learn in here, uh, show that the explanations that we usually hold for things uh, don't hold water. And it's the exact paradoxical opposite that holds more water and might be more accurate than the, the logical way of going about things. However, philosophy, all you have to do is give a good argument. Theology. If you have a statement that you want to make in theology, GP, bring it home on this one. If you, have to, if you have an argument you want to make about how we should live, why we're here, what we should be doing while we're here, how we should treat others, what's the authority you reference? To God. The God. God. The, the text. Right? The yeah, text. So, yeah. The written text. In, in theology, you make an argument, you, you state a claim, and then you reference, this is where it was said so in the text. In philosophy... It's a logical argument, or other philosophers' arguments. That kind of research is called hermeneutics, by the way. Theology and philosophy use something called hermeneutics. I'll write that up there because it's an interesting word to realize. This is different from science. Hermeneutics. It's when you argue about what someone else wrote. <laughs> and, but, yeah? Okay. And, and the word hermeneutics actually means the art and the science of correctly interpreting the scriptures. But you, you all heard that? It's from uh, Greek Hermes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, hermeneutics. Yeah, the interpretation of texts. That's basically what you do in philosophy and, and in theology. That's it, GP. Thank you. In science, there's a different rule of the game. You have to do research. And that's what we're going to really talk about.